Um, so today we're going to talk about Bali, uh, uh, Bali, um, which is a neural codec language model, or zero shot text to speech synthesizers. Boy, what a mouthful that is. Um, neural codec is just a model that does kind of translations language for us. A uh, zero shot being once you get the model trained in any, everything, you can just go in and give it text and it doesn't actually train from the text. It just uses it and synthesizes speech from that. So it's pretty cool. Um, in fact, who would use this thing? Well, people that might use this would be uh, especially, who it's especially important. Every, I like text-to-speech for a number of reasons, but unsighted people obviously need this. And this is even people that can see and do have vision problems and what uh, acuity problems uh, find it much easier to listen rather than read slides in very bad fonts and things like that. And in many situations, when you create this stuff, editing in a document is much easier than doing voice. Does that sound wrong to anybody? It, it actually turns out to be right. Um, what we do uh, here is we produce uh, training materials and when we send them up for courses, let's say I had a, like an intro to machine learning uh, type course and things like that. We sent it up to our folks, at, friends at Pluralsight. They looked at it and they sent me back just tons of like, no, you need to fix this. Time code XXX has this problem. There's a pop here, blah, 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 that sort of thing. Had I had a tool like this, I could have just like, give because I script everything out. I script every word out. I could have just scripted the words out and hit go and hit the button and it would have just done its thing, right? It would have been much, much easier on me. Um, so in that case, cleaner audio equals less redo equals less time equals you can do more work with your time, so on and so forth. Uh, I also happened to be tutoring a young man uh, for a uh, honor STEMS program down in a school in Los Angeles friend of mine runs that and asked me to tutor him this year. Um, and he works as a side hustle, I guess that's the cool term now, uh, with a bunch of YouTubers. Um, it's a uh, gaming, I guess they're gamers and things like that. Um, and they produce YouTube content. And one of the biggest things they have in that particular space is when they're talking voice that they wear out their voices. Hang on just a sec. Uh, and they, they wear out their voices. And when they wear out their voices, they can't produce more content. Therefore, that impacts their money that they can produce. And he went into all the monetization and it was kind of crazy for that. So he's actually building a uh, text-to-speech system for his honors program. And then he's going to try to make that a commercial product that he can sell to YouTubers because he knows how to deal with that market. So... Pretty cool for an 18 year old, I think. Um, so Jerry on that one, uh, mm -hmm. one could potentially, you know, in near future, uh, give the notes, the song text, and <laughs> the system can sing the song in my voice. Yeah, yeah, I mean, well, I mean, it, uh, now with Volley, it can do that, right? That's because that's one of its claims to fame is to be able to do the voice. Um, and one of the metrics that we, uh, uh, for our coursework that we do is that people are very forgiving for like glitches on the screen, but if you get the audio wrong, so um, I don't know if you've ever talked for like an hour straight uh, reading a script or something like that, or even 10 minutes straight, but you build up saliva in your mouth and it sounds kind of gross. You can hear, you, you know, it comes out in the recordings and things like that. So it's not unusual for us to produce uh, one, one and a half hours of, you know, content uh, in a day. And by the time it takes us four to five hours to edit that. And by the time we edit all the, the screw ups and things out, we end up with like 30 minutes. So that's an eight hour day to produce 30 minutes of decent content that we can produce. And the vast majority is... Uh, video is uh, audio editing. It's not 
the video editing, because that's easy. You can do that, you know, PowerPoint or whatever tool we present slides works really, really well for that. But the editing tools for uh, audio are very, very difficult to use. And it's just so easy to mess up because the way human, the human anatomy is, is we're just not meant to talk for that sort of thing. Um, it's even worse for YouTubers. My daughter happens to work for a gaming company. She actually gets paid to uh, test games. So that's pretty cool. But, uh, you know, they talk about YouTubers and things like that on the gaming channels. They only make money when they produce content and they can't produce content when the, after that screaming, you, if you've ever watched a, uh, you know, a gaming channel, after that screaming that they do, that, you know, they may have to take a day or so off because their voice is just shot after 30, 40 minutes of screaming, all of that sort of stuff. Um, so that is, you know, hitting them. And, you know, there's just a whole bunch of scenarios where you want to do text-to-speech. The big thing, of course, is uh, natural sound is, is key. And many of the current generated, you know, type systems are very, have a, they have a no tonal intonation, so monotone, and it's just very robotic. There's no emotion, that sort of stuff. Um, so one of the things that Bali does is that they allow emotion and pauses. Think of William Shatner speaking in his, the way he, he speaks. And, you know, you can get that, that identifies him. It's, it's part of his thing that he does things like that and various other things like that. Gary? Yes, sir. Um, inject the comment uh, or the response wherever it's appropriate. But I'm wondering how current and this system handles um, kind of the, the, like, there's a lot of chuckling that you inject into your, your presentation here. Mm -hmm. How does that take place in a text to speech? Um, that's a good question. I don't think they're quite there that yet. However, I haven't tried that. That's a that's a good one, Roger. I haven't tried that with Bali. I, I, I should, you know, I should maybe create some some things. They haven't really opened it up enough. I think from a lot of that to get tried, but we'll see. But I think uh, the code is open for you to go and train it. Oh, is it? Uh, yes, uh, from what I recollect. Okay. Uh, the, I, and I've also seen uh, on some Discord channels, people are trying to train it for different... Uh, how, how are they uh, doing? I've just seen that. I've not followed up on those. Uh, oh, okay. But I've seen that happening. Uh, the other thing uh, on, on Roger's comment is, you know, just like how chat GPT is too... Uh, I mean, it, it is confidently confident about everything but it's too too sophisticated if you may it's mm -hmm. not the natural uh uh talking if you may mm -hmm. so i'm assuming you know the first version of wally wally is also like highly sophisticated yes it may have pauses and all but not uh who and how and chuckles and other things like it's like a serious presentation but <laughs> or, or delivery of text is what i'm assuming yeah yeah we're gonna actually uh I'm going to go through, I'm just about done with this, and then we're going to go on to the uh, abstract. And at the very end of the abstract, which is really cool, they actually have a link to their uh, kind of test page, and we can actually, we'll go, we'll go there a couple of times. Um, so just one more thing on that yeah. one, Terry, if you may yeah. find me. So um, one, one use case that I heard about was, let's say you like someone's voice, uh -huh. uh, you know, let's say coming from India, I know there's an actor called M. Sabachan. He has a very nice, deep voice, and we all love it. Uh, I may want to listen to some narration in his voice rather than someone else's voice. So it can potentially be used for that as well. And, not, and for people who, you know, some relatives that you miss, you can use their recording and then generate uh, yeah. audio yeah. from that. I, I would think, uh, yeah, even in the voice, but even in the uh, accent or... Um... I won't say pronunciation of some words and things like that are, you know, are slightly different, even though let's say it's all English, different regions pronounce certain words just slightly. And it may, may be more natural for somebody from a different region to hear it in, you know, the way they grew up hearing things, um, you know? So, yeah, I, I think there's a, a lot of things there that, that really would be useful. Um, all right. One more slide. And I think we're done here. Um, and this is kind of my foe. This is something called the Mel spectrogram. Has anybody ever seen one of these before? 
Um, so, yeah. So what you're looking at here, I'll, I'll go on here on the, on the left-hand side. Um, this is a frequency of, this is voice frequency coming in or the audio frequency coming in. It doesn't have to be voice, it could be any audio. Um, and this usually runs up to, you know, 16K because the human voice really, unless you're, you know, up there where dogs can hear you talk, you know, it really isn't up there. And what you're seeing here is the strength. This is a strength meter on the right-hand side, this dB thing, it's dB scale. Um, and, you know, the, the hotter it is here, the, the louder it is. So you're seeing here the lower frequencies are louder on this particular one. Um, and notice this is a plus dB scale relative to some standard. It, usually it's probably an absolute, it's a negative number because you wouldn't want to, you wouldn't want to uh, go to zero dB because what happens is then you, you kind of blow out the microphone and you get that sound and all that. Um, so they probably, you know, flip this around just for illustration purposes. But uh, you can see here, if you look kind of these ridges and things like that, that's like a, you can see the multiple frequencies in the speech, right? Here's a lot of bass ones down at, uh, down here. And then there's some other one, there's other ones as we move up, because I'm moving up. If we look over here on the Hertz channel, the low tones, uh, let's say a subwoofer you have in your house just for your uh, TV, you know, so you can rattle the windows type thing. You're talking, you know, in the uh, sub 100 Hertz. So you're down here toward the bottom. Most human voice, you know, you're you're much higher. So, um, the you know these things are just showing all sorts of frequencies repeating and what have you not. And this is actually the data that we use. A variation of this data, a quantitized version of this data, is what what uh, Dolly or Volley uses to train itself. So if you haven't ever seen that before, I just thought I'd throw that in there because they're good, they talk in the favor about spectrograms. Okay, so enough slides and things like that. Let's move on and let me bring my bring my uh, my uh, document up. Let's see. Let's see. I'll just go to my drive. Drive. And let's see over here. East Bay. Hey, Jerry. So yes, not to. Jump ahead oh. here, but huh? uh, is it not to jump ahead into your presentation? But uh, I think they did away with Mel's spectrogram in this uh, in this model. Is that right? Yes, they do not use the Mel spectrogram. But I just I just wanted to show that for illustration purposes. So um, you know you may see it sometime as you're reading through these. In fact, let's just start with the That's abstract. A... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, but that's a good point because every paper before this for text to speech uh, leverages Mel spectrogram going all the way back to 70s and 80s when AT&T and you know, others were first trying to get the speech to text going. Yeah. Or text to speech, sorry. Text to speech going. going. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about robotic, huh? <laughs> robotic. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So this is here's the abstract for it. And uh, you can see the team here at Microsoft. Um, so uh, I'm just going to go through kind of the highlighted things. So they're doing a uh, text-to-speech synthesis. Uh, they have a neural codec language model. So as you guys probably know, we have all these big language models out there these days. Um, and they are powered, they're powered all by a neural network architecture called transformers. This is essentially taking voice and moving in it it into that transformer space. So if you're uh, new to machine learning and things like that, what transformers do is they learn how to encode various things in a compact way and very efficient. It's what powers, um, gosh, my brain guys, help me out here. What do we all, uh, chat GPT. Or GPT-3, I guess, which runs under chat, which chat GPT-3 is built on top of. So it's the engine that has all the knowledge base. And we'll talk about some of these things in, in just a moment here. Uh, moving on from there, um, it says here, uh, text-to-speech as a conditional language model rather than continuous signal regression. And that's what uh, Deb was getting to when they're you look at those spectrograms that I just showed you, that's kind of a continuous, right? I don't know if you noticed there was time on the bottom. 
And so like half a second, this came out, a second that came out, a second and a half that came out, so on and so forth. And you could actually see almost, if you play the waveforms coming out when you look at it, but they're gonna switch that around and, and digitize it into a, a structure, an array of data, if you will. Um, okay. So the other thing they did is uh, they treated, uh, treated it like a language model. And the second thing they did is they scaled up the training data to 60,000 hours of English speech, which is, as they point out, hundreds of times larger than any existing systems. So those ones that Dev was talking about, those might be trained on tens of hours or even 100 hours on a very, very strong one, but not. 60,000 hours of English speech. Um, there are, in fact, the uh, student that I'm working with uh, is looking to determine which database he's going to use to train his models. And he's trying to do it on a budget. Although the company he works for and does all that stuff for those YouTubers has an account and is giving him, uh, is, is a P100 uh, an NVIDIA box or um, something 100? I don't, I don't remember what the... T100? T100? T100. V100 and P100. I think yeah. P4 and there's T4. Yeah, okay. One of those, they said, hey, we'll just set one up for you on, on, the, on our cloud and you can do it whatever you want. You know, don't worry about the bill. So <laughs> it'd be nice <laughs> if somebody would do that for everybody, right? Uh, but anyway, so anyway, so um, that is a lot of data they're training on. So these models, like all transformer-based models, typically need a lot of training and a lot of data to power them. Uh, and what happens with these big models is something we call in-context learning capabilities. Uh, and essentially that means that even without seeing that sample from the user, uh, Dev was speaking about somebody that, you know, he likes to hear because he likes his accent and thing, even without hearing that person say the words that you know is in the text it will figure out how to convert the generated speech to his intonation his pacing uh the environment he was in all of that sort of stuff so that is that is extremely powerful without even be trained on it it just does it you know at generation time so that's pretty impressive um, experiment show that Valley Valley. Hey, hey, Jerry. Yes, sir. If, if I can just like add to what you said briefly. So mm -hmm. in text, basically it means you don't have to have been trained on any of this. You just have to have some text in the prompt that comes to the left of where you're asking it to do something. So in this case, it's not just text that's going into it. It's going to need some audio information, but right. to your point, it does not need to be trained on that particular person's voice. It just needs something to its left. <laughs> I don't know how to describe it except like. No, know, no, we'll, we'll get there actually. actually. We'll actually yeah, get there, Ted. Yeah, the paper actually kind of goes into the the model architecture here on the uh, on that. So we'll we'll get a little bit to that. Yeah. So um, and it, it as it says here that Bali significantly. Can you guys see my cursor over here? Bali significantly important state of the state of the art uh, zero shot TTS systems. Blah blah blah. Um, in terms of speech naturalist and speaker similarity, in addition, we find Bali could preserve speaker's emotion in the acoustic environment of the acoustic prompt and synthesis. So essentially, it can, if you're a voice actor, let's say, and you're reading Moby Dick, there are sections of that where you're stuck inside a wheel, so you need a lot of echoing and things like that, right? And there are sections in it when you're on a ship, so you might want to have, you know, ship noises going on and things like that. And, you know, uh, you know, it would be, you'd hear like waves and all that kind of stuff. So the acoustic environment, it can actually generate it in that format. But again, just from text. So you just have the script that says, you know, Captain Ahab said, blah, 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 blah. And it puts all that other acoustic environment stuff in there. So that's pretty cool. So we're going to take a quick side side thing just and do a quick demo if you guys don't mind um i think it's really cool that they did this by the way just so you understand how this is uh oh and this is kind of the overall architecture of it too we'll get we're actually going to get to that later i just want to show you how it works 
So this is uh, Liberty Speech is a, is a database. It's a sample database used for text to speech uh, type learning. It's, it's the one they use, the 60K-ish sort of things. So you can see the text here we're going to use. And this is just a regular uh, speaker prompt. And this won't actually be this text, but you'll just get an idea of what the person listens sounds like. He descended the ladder and found himself soon upon firm rock. Can you hear that? Yeah. You guys can hear yeah. that? Okay. So that, what Vali does is Vali needs a three second sample of the person's voice. So he this was the three second. He found himself soon upon firm rock. Uh, the three second sample that they're going to use. Now, this is kind of the ground truth of what what a human, you know, actor saying does it, but not this particular speaker, just somebody else. They moved thereafter cautiously about the hut, groping before and about them to Actually, find something the to show guy. that the Warrington had fulfilled his mission. Okay. And that's actually from the training set. Um, and here's what a typical TTS system not using the technology that Valley uh, does produces. They move thereafter cautiously about the hot groping before and about them to find something to show that Warrington had fulfilled his mission. Yeah, really great, right? Let's see what Valley can do. They moved thereafter cautiously about the hut, groping before and about them to find something to show that Warrington had fulfilled his mission. Pretty good, pretty good. Yeah. Hey, yeah. uh, Jerry, so yes, maybe if you can play a speaker, then baseline, so we know what previous was. Oh, okay. And then, <laughs> I'm just thinking, just to get that. Okay, oh, that's cool. Uh, let's let's do that. Let's let's do this one here, the Honorable Worship, blah, blah, blah. Amen. Windows, the wooden shutters to close over them. That... So did you hear the environment she's in? It sounds really tinny. I don't, I don't know what that is. Like you're talking in a phone booth or something, right? So let's see what the baseline did with that. Ye, his honorable worship is within, but he hath a godly minister or two with him, and likewise a leech. Yeah, not so good. Let's hear what Vali does with it. Yea, his honorable worship is within, but he hath a godly minister or two with him, and likewise a leech. So whatever that was in that environment, did you notice it picked that up? Pretty interesting that it does that. Um, Could you get the ground ahead. for the same thing, Jerry? Uh, uh, let's see, was it, was it this one here? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I... Yea, his honorable worship is within, but he hath a godly minister or two with him, and likewise a leech. So it doesn't have that background noise that you kind of heard, or whatever whatever that effect was, right? Um, but 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 when we get to the Yea, body sample, his honorable worship is within, but he hath a godly minister or two with him, and likewise so it's, a leech. So it's picking up the environment of this original speaker prompt over here. So what that says is if you're a vo if you're trying to produce the voice that, you know, you can just get after you get this person, you can say, oh, this is Miriam in, I don't know, a jar or something, I don't know, in a phone booth or something like that. And then you can just, you know, key that in when you're when you're producing um, her talking in a phone booth or something, whatever that's supposed to be. And they, they have a bunch more samples and I'm not going to, you know. They have some here from Libri, uh, Libra Speech, and they have some from VCTK, which is another one. Let's just try one of those. There will be widespread support on all sides. Um, and if we hear what that sounds like in a normal generator? We have to reduce the number of plastic bags. Yeah, that's that's not doing so good on that speech text, but on Vali? We have to reduce the number of plastic bags. So there he's, I assume, British. Uh, I don't know my British accents. Somebody could probably tell me. But it seems to have prever uh, pre uh, preserved that. And then the ground truth? We have to reduce the number of plastic bags. Okay. So anyway, um, it does some pretty cool stuff, huh? Um, we're going to come back to this. So I'm going to come go back to the slides. And, uh, oh, not slides. Uh, here, back to the paper. Okay. So. Um, this is kind of the overview of Vali. Um, tell me, guys, uh, that know this stuff, what does this look like to you? Anybody thought? Okay. Uh, 
let's wait and we'll see. This will expand out in the center and then you're going to know what it was. Okay. Uh, let's see here. So this is here where they say, unlike previous pipelines, which went from phonemies, we were just discussing this this afternoon, to a mel spectrogram to a waveform, the pipeline is phonemy to a discrete code, so a number, a series of numbers associated with that, to a waveform. And what that then does is if you're going from a discrete code to a waveform, the system can then incorporate the things and then change it around. Now, this is for the sampling. This is that sampling that the phonemy would be the sampling of uh, of your voice, that three, sec three second sampling that it created essentially a code for to learn. And then when you feed it then another uh, bit of text, it'll actually convert that text using this coding mechanism into the output waveform. So that's how they get that environment, your accents, whatever, that's how it works at a very, very high level. We're gonna go deeper. Questions? Okay. So Jerry, I think you're gonna mm -hmm. go into this, but phonemes, mm -hmm. I oh, mean, yeah, that's- Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. What, I think we should go with phony memes. That's what phony I'm gonna go with. Okay, okay, phony memes. Okay, phony memes. Uh, phony memes are the, Parts of speech uh, in a given. I, I, I'm just kidding. I, 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 I know you knew that, Dave, because you're a Stanford grad, man, and those guys are smart. Did I actually graduate from oh, oh, that's right. You bailed and you took this, the way of making money at Stanford. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's actually better if you drop that. There's no money in academia, man. <laughs> what the heck happened? Go do something real with your life. Uh, anyway. So uh, uh, it, it is, it is me, technically phoneme. Uh, Ted was right, though. Sorry. Yes, that that's okay. That's okay. Okay, phoneme. Um, but anyway, those are the like the words in a in a, uh, or the sounds in a word. So if it was tomorrow, you'd have t ma ro. <laughs> you know, it's almost not exactly syllables, but it's it's just the pronunciation pieces. So you're breaking those in. And then you're putting them into a, a big code table, if you will, so that when it sees the text, it goes, oh, I've got to create, you know, tomorrow. Well, I need one of those, one of those, and one of those. And this guy puts them together that way. So here we go. Okay. It's not quite that easy, but, you know, I'm giving you the marketing one-on-one -on -one version where the rubber meets the sky. Uh, okay. And it, ge it generates the... Uh, audio codex codes based on the phonemes, it, phonemes and the acoustic code prompts. I'm sorry, I can't say it any other way than the phonemes. Uh, to the target contents and the, and the speaker's voice, which we've already seen, but here you have it, such it is. Uh, so it does something called, this is zero shot text to speech. So essentially it's already trained. You don't have to go in and train it. It just kind of does it. Speech editing, content creation, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and I apologize. I uh, I'm, I did a lot of this stuff, this presentation sitting in my hotel here at night, and I kind of got a little crazy with the highlighting here. So we're going to switch to mostly the the orange color here. Um, so here's a big point that I was kind of making here is most of the time when you do this type of speech work, you require really clean data from a recording studio. I have a recording studio in my house. There's $3,000 of computers, microphones, not probably $5,000, uh, audio filters and things like that in a closet five feet from me. So you really need that level of gear to do it at, this, at the sound that these can produce. Um, let's see here. Let's see here. Uh, large data crawled from the internet cannot meet this requirement. And will always lead to degraded performance. Aha. Because training data is relatively small, current to still suffer from poor generalization. Now, yeah, okay. Anyway, we'll move on. You know, they're trying to sell something here. Uh, uh, I, I just want to make one point, and, and more so for, let's say, Google, mm -hmm. right? They mm -hmm. have tons and tons of YouTube data with 
transcripts. Mm -hmm. So I wonder why that is like, at least for Google, I, I don't know about Microsoft. I'm sure they also should have tons of data, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I fail to, uh, or, or movies, right? Movies have sub, uh, the, the closed captions. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm with Dev on, like that really caught my attention as well. Like, I mean, we can do super resolution with images. Is there mm -hmm. a reason we can't do something similar with audio as well? You could, but remember what their, their goal is. Their goal is to very quickly take voice actor A and put him, put him or her in all these situations uh, with different voices, different cadences, that sort of thing. And essentially, let's say we're making a movie. We would just take the script and throw it in and it says, okay, Sue's going to play this part here. And we have, we have, uh, it, it's a, you know, it's a horror movie. So she's going to be very scared in this scene. And then she's going to kill the monster. So she can be real cocky here. And we have voice, we have voice of her in her really, you know, scared mood and her really cocky mood. So all we have to do is put these together. So. Okay. Yeah. You know, that's a little different, I think, than what you're, what you're talking about. Dave, uh, Dave, if I'm understanding it. Uh, okay, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, this is me and my scroll. You know, an iPad really oh, sorry, sucks. Just, just shout it out. Yeah. Yeah, Don't need for Jerry, I was sorry, I, I didn't want to. Um, so ahead. Jerry, is, this is trained on 60,000 hours of English speech, but is it is that labeled data? Like, does it have the English words written with it? Or ah. is it literally just the audio? No, it is it is both audio and the text. So okay. they go into this late, later, but okay, um, yeah. there are these standard sets. No, I'm not even going to cover it. I'm just going to skip it. I'm just going to tell you now. So um, there are standards, standard uh, recordings of all these Englishes. A lot of these were audio books. Sure, yeah. Um, and so they could, you know, if you get the book, you get the text, right? So, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, the other thing they did is when they didn't have that in that case, um, is they actually did a uh, voice to text type thing. And then uh, I don't know if they did like a mechanical Turk or just hired a bunch of of, of people, uh, you know, like Tesla does with their uh, their driving data and things like that to co to go through that and fix it up, fix up, you know, where the, the uh, voice to text got the translation wrong, you know and fix it up. I don't know what they did, how they, how they kind of did that, but that's, that's what they did. So that's where they get their two sources, their, um, their voice recording, you know, from those audio books, and then like the text of the book or some version thereof, they merge together. Okay. Is that answer your question? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great explanation. Yeah. yeah. And, so, and it doesn't have like timestamps in it, does it? It's just like the audio and the text and there's nothing like linking them. It just has to figure that out, right? Um, audio in the text. No, they are linked, I believe. That's a good question. I don't know. I don't know the answer. Yeah, Some data sets think... have a phoneme timestamp mm -hmm. and I don't remember which those are. Okay. So, so we did time, have paper. So every phoneme is labeled with a timestamp. Yeah. Okay. Well, I've heard of those, but they'd be pretty limited because you can imagine how laborious. It's, it's, yeah, and it's not even that. It's just because people make mispronounce all the time. It's, it's going to have to be that. They have to listen very carefully. So I'm, I'm sure there are, I believe there are, but they're pretty, pretty scarce, I would think. Okay. Um, I guess the point they're trying to make, and at least that I got from this, all this, was that this is yet again a number, another one of these things we're seeing that we couldn't do until we had enough data, enough compute, and enough capability to build these massive models that we're seeing like GPT-3, you know, that powers chat GPT and things like that. Things that five years ago, maybe six or seven or something like that, would have been, you know, really way way out there and now they're becoming like oh yeah you know hey well, a billion whatever no big deal you know and this is a uh uh an ongoing thing that's going to go on because computing is getting cheaper storage is getting cheaper whatever the resources we need to make this sort of stuff work regardless whether it's language or you know any other field we're just getting we're collecting data we're storing it we can process it we can build these extremely powerful uh, neural networks now
Hey, Jerry. So just a couple yes, of points. Sir. So I think we did one paper last year, Wave 2 Net 2 or something like that from Facebook. Mm -hmm. And there they did not have uh, one of the data sets they had was the audiobook reading, uh, which did not have the timestamps. Mm -hmm. And they actually uh, uh, did the, what do you call it, the contrasting learning mm -hmm. between the text and the speech, and then try to uh, uh, align that. And then they were able to get the uh, appropriate, uh, in that case, it was the text to speech, same thing. Yeah. So uh, there are examples from recent past where uh, text to speech was done uh, without the uh, without the timestamps alignment. But at the same time, uh, you know, the other thing that you mentioned, and I'm sure you'll go into that with this codec thing. I think this is something which uh, we have seen even in the uh, vision side, right? The VQ GAN. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The codec, right? So apparently, and I'm just thinking out loud and, and not to, again, jump before. Uh, no, maybe no, no. I'll, I'll wait for my comment. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's like a few thousands of Codes is all it needs, <laughs> and then uh, unlike you know, if you actually try to do it with the uh, with the uh, uh, with a continuous domain, you know, the manifold maybe you know, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. With the noise and all, it could be pretty large. But with codex, uh, these are like some specific uh, set of codes, and that's all it works with, which is pretty amazing, even from the you know, point of your view, vision, and and now this, and then yeah, just the last point. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you 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 were to no, say no, no, yeah, yeah, go ahead, continue, please. Yeah, and and even though it does appear that compute and everything is getting cheaper, but I think the Moore's law has hit a wall. So as such, I'm finding that it is not getting as cheaper at the same rate, at least as it was in the past. So mm. uh, the machines are getting bigger. If you look at the new GPUs, they, those are not retaining the same size they are getting bigger and bigger the new 4090 ti from nvidia is going to be four uh four slots uh pcie slots <laughs> uh, that's the base model so uh, uh the the uh, vendors will maybe make four or five slots which is like you basically have one gpu and then you look for other parts components in your system somewhere but anyway uh, i i mean that's my belief and i don't want to derail the main discussion here okay yeah well that's a good point um Okay, so some of this stuff, uh, you know, this is, oh, you know, we're really good. It's really tough. It's recent years, no improvement in text. Yeah, it, improvement in data increase in text language models, which is kind of what I just said here. Um, blah, blah, blah. Let's see the description. We trained uh, Vali with LibreLite. Oh, this is one of those things. Um, and this is, I don't know how many times they pretty much Pretty much do this they kind of like poo poo on the mail spectrogram <laughs> so these are current systems use the mail spectrogram and you do uh signal regression so you know your voice has tone pitches up and down and things like that and essentially what they're trying to do is learn learn those so the word you know certain words we learn that regression and as uh dev pointed out you know this codex uh thing seems to be much easier to do uh second one of the things, remember I told you from our perspective as a company, when we produce these courses, it's really a pain in the butt. We want to do text speech. We actually, you know, purchased a, a membership, one of these things for hundred bucks a month or something like that. And even with, you know, what was a reasonable amount of training, my, my wife develops courses too. Like I stuck, if she was in her office for all afternoon. So four hours of her just talking and things like that, the bottom was still hit or miss. So, you know, it takes a lot of a lot of time to do that. Um, whereas something like this, we could have done. She would have only had to do those three second things, maybe two or three times. You know, one when you're just talking like at the chalkboard, one when you're trying to emphasize things, and another one maybe when you're speaking to a, a, a student or something. You might have a little bit different pitch and things like that. So, big change. Um, well, the previous. Uh, mm -hmm. This paragraph there is something about if you know requires high quality clean data mm -hmm. for recording is part mm -hmm. of why there's so much more training hours that that requirement's not you you can use like lower quality data um you actually want the low quality data because i mean what makes what makes 
the, da the data low quality. Well, there's background noise. But wait, we wanted to pick up the environment, right? For that and things like remember that one of the the lady speaking there there was something i don't remember what was going on but there was something so yeah um this this system not only just does the speech it does it does the speech in an environment which is like i said you could be in an echoey hall that sort of thing which normally would just be disastrous i mean we'd normally record it straight and then put in the echo afterwards something like that but um anyway it is what it is. Uh, it's actually better. I wish we would have had this years ago now that we're getting out of that one business. But anyway, any other questions while we're stopped here for a moment? Okay. Um, okay, so let's just move on here. And, uh, you know, you can, I'm just going to get to the kind of the summary of the first section here. Uh, <clears throat> so they propose Volley, first TTS, strong context, learning competitive as GPT-3, because everybody wants to claim they're like GPT-3 because which powers chat GPT, because it has all the, the mind share. Uh, but, it, but it actually kind of is. Um, it does have in-context learning capability, which is that, which lets us do that three, we only have to do a little, little sample, those three second samples, and then we can go on to word, have you say words that you've never said before and things like that, just because somebody put them in text. Uh, prompt base zero shot TTS text to speech. Uh, Jerry, yes, sir. Uh, can I pose a question about this in context learning? Mm -hmm. um, does that include things like you know, is this a question? Is it an emphasis? Um, those types of things. Is that what it means by in context? Yeah, because it's seen so many, it's seen so many hours of, and you know of reading books or whatever the source material is. What was it, 60,000 hours or something like that? It seems so many of those. The English language, you know, we have this natural tendency when we say a question to go, you know, our pitch goes up at the end, right? What right. do you think, you know, <laughs> you know, right, like right. that. And that pattern repeats. So that gets ingrained into the model. So that now when it, it's, you know, you, Roger's voice, blah, 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 blah. And it's coming, to, you're coming to a question. It sees a, the question mark in the text. It will probably, you know, naturally follow that. Okay. With, with you know, the, the graviliness or whatever you want to call it, the tenor in your voice and things like that. Okay, great. That's kind of what I assume, but I just want to clarify that. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. Well, from what I read, that that's exactly how it works. Uh, and, and here, here again, the yeah, question I, was, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to say, so, you know, uh, I think uh, I, I forget the context in which I want to say that. So this Wally is, uh, initially I thought it is from OpenAI because of Dolly, <laughs> yeah. uh, but it could very, and because it's Microsoft, so it could very well be a you know collaboration or, or some uh, part derived from, well, not the model, but I don't know. But apparently it's very similar to that in that regard. It's auto-generating the, mm -hmm. the speech. And I'm sorry, I forgot the context when I started speaking. <laughs> Why I wanted to bring that up. Please continue. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see here. Uh, diverse input. Yeah. So once again, I repeated what it's going to say here. It says provide diverse input, same input text, and keep the acoustic environment and the speaker's emotion uh, of the acoustic prompt. Did you notice when those samples and things like that, there were times when the generated text actually paused for emphasis? You know, I thought that was pretty wild that it, that it actually did that. I, there must have been a comma in the document or something like that. And it knew that after, you know, a very, you know, whatever sort of piece before that, that, that comma was not like a, you know, I don't know, 50 millisecond or, or you know, I, I'm sorry, 500 millisecond pause. It was really like a 1.5 second pause or something like that, because it really put a long one in there, I was noticing. Anyway, okay. And that, uh, that also is amplified, I think you said, by the kind of the, the speaker style. The, uh, yeah, style. so you know, yeah, like I, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick on William Shatner just because he has that that style, right? But you know, he goes, when the time is right. <laughs> I mean, his pauses are, you know, you know, these big things like that. And I'm sure you just said William Shatner has style. <laughs> well I'll, I'll give him props i mean if you heard a commercial for uh what's the thing he does with uh, uh kd uh, price, 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 price line yeah did you have to even look up from 
your book to see who was on TV. No, you did not because you knew he was Bill Shatner. So, <laughs> and, and by the way, a, a quick sidebar, uh, just for a quick second, his economic deal he did with Priceline is actually breathtaking because what he did is, if you remember, after 9-11, uh, yes. Priceline crashed and he took equity and like a very flat, like SAG level, like 10 grand a commercial kind of rate. And, you know, that he's made, <laughs> I don't know, some crazy number, more than he made it in Star Trek, actually, on Priceline. Well, like way more. So anyways, total meaningless sidebar. But no, 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 no. That's, that's all says we should be doing commercials rather than any of this other stuff, you know? And getting <laughs> so, equity, getting equity. Getting <laughs> equity, that's right. With my luck, I'd get equity and, you know, uh, you know, you know, the Titanic uh, boat building company or something like that, you know, that's just the way yeah, my you just got to do enough of it where it's just portfolioed. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, uh, I'm not going to go into all this related work stuff. If you guys don't mind, I don't, I don't, I don't see a lot of value in it unless you wanted to do. Um, yeah, just a time check. We're, we're at 730 right now. So, okay. So we will get probably through this next section. And um, for those of people that are new, we're not, we want people to enjoy things, have a good time and get the, you know, be part of the conversation and things. We will not rush through these things. So it looks like we're going to end up splitting this into two weeks or something like that. So we'll just do it. So please come uh -huh. again next week. Um, okay. So this is uh, kind of a pic overall picture of this thing. Um, and I'm going to sort of go ahead. I have a question, Sherry. Mm -hmm. oh, it's mm -hmm. how, how do they evaluate these models? You know, because it's speech and you're looking at like nuances, like, you know, how does it sound, et cetera? Mm -hmm. um, how is it? How is it evaluated? It's, it, it has, you know, it's your normal loss mechanism, of course, that you're doing, but just like, you know, it's essentially a trans set of transformers underneath. So we use a standard transformer um, evaluation criteria. Now, that's the whole big thing about switching fr from, uh, you know, male spectrogram and things like that to that codex, those encodings of words and things like that. Mm -hmm. So we can look at that encoding and then ap apply conditioning based on that small little voice prompt it did of you. Mm -hmm. Hey, Jerry. Yes, sir. Can, can you actually speak to the what the loss is? Because it's like not clear that you can use mean squared error in the in yeah. the uh, in the power space. Right. It's not clear that you can even use mean squared error in the frequency domain either right. so like right what is what are you actually dipping exactly exactly i mean you like if you go the other way if you're like evaluating a, a speech to text it's mm -hmm. easy for a machine to like process the text and say is this right or wrong you know edit distance blah 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 mm -hmm. but i'm wondering how you would do it here obviously you know we, you don't want to do it subjective and have people no. listen to it. Um, no, no, no. Does but, it but no. Yeah, this picture sort of gets to it, and I was going to wait, but I'll, well, we should speak okay, about that, it now. Since we're... I'll, I'll, I'll wait for you to get there. That's cool. uh, we, I don't think we'll get there until next week. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. I, yeah. I'll try to be here next week as well. So, okay. No, no problem. <laughs> but the, the bottom line here is it's showing, right? The, uh, uh, the, they, have, they have tokens, they quantitize the data, and then you're dealing with numbers, pure numbers, not waveforms, not anything crazy like that. Hard, you know, zero, I don't know if it's zero to one based or something normalized in the zero to one sp base space or anything, but you you can just use whatever standard loss functions you would to align those things similar. The same thing you would do in a transformer. I, I'm going to keep saying that because when you start looking at this, this thing looks a lot like a transformer because it really is. Um, okay, okay, but but slow down here. Go back to the okay, diagram. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. This is this is a bad diagram, Ted. I'm going to say it right now. Using, okay, what okay. is some derivative of Fourier or like how is it getting into that space? Do you know? Uh, the actual encoding of this. Uh, this is this this over here on the left is is a is a waveform coming in. 
Right. If you will. So, okay, that was my first question. So, waveform coming in. So, basically, that's a linear sequence, mm -hmm. right? It's a one dimensional vector. Time is the dimension, and you just basically have power as mm -hmm. bigger numbers and smaller numbers over time, right? It's bigger numbers. That's, yeah. I mean, unless it's stereo, that's what a waveform is. It's just a single vector. Uh, right? Yeah, I think, let me just go through this real quick here and just see if there's anything here. Okay. Yeah, okay. Now, go ahead, continue on with your, your conversation. Yeah, so if it's a waveform oh. and your sampling frequency is 44 kilohertz, mm -hmm. then that means that a three-second clip is has whatever three times 44 is, right? 132,000 floating point numbers between min and max. Mm -hmm. That's your input. Right. Well, yes? yeah, kind of, sort of. Um, the next next section talks about quantization <laughs> because they don't want to do that, Ted. No, that's, right, but that, that's why I'm actually asking, like, like before we even get fancy, just like, what are the data types? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, you, so you're absolutely right. Voices, you know, it has to be a representation, an analog, an analog signal that can convert to digital. As you said, you just described the process of doing that. Um, so here it says a pre-trained TTS through an auto regressive. Uh, no, this is somebody else's paper. I'm sorry. Hey, Jerry, uh, if you scroll down to the top of page five, I think it is. Page five. It talks about a pre-trained neural audio codec. Yes. And codec as our yes. tokenizer. Yes. And then once yeah. it's a token, then it, transformers can deal with it. Spits right. It out, spits out tokens and the decoder model take, converts right. it back to waveform. Yeah. Uh, this one here. So they're actually using... A token. This says their tokenizer, um, and Ted, I think this is already pre-trained to do the work that you're talking about. Actually, convert it. So it says, and we can see encoded convolutional encoded and input or 24k kilohertz audio across varying bit rates produces embedding at 75 hertz for input forms at 24. Eh, so this this essentially right is it's it's not preserved. This isn't ah. a lot. I this get it. It's, it's, it's a two-dimensional compression. So it compresses exactly. both time and the shape. Okay, that's interesting. Did, did you get that, Ted? Um, well, I'm, I, I'm not sure I'm if gonna... I know what it's doing, but but one of the things that, Jerry, I don't know if you saw in the chat, is specifically what makes Bally great is not this encoder because they just reused something off oh, the shelf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They did not invent this. Let me, let me put it this way. After reading about Valley, what I'm finding is they're taking a lot of existing technology and putting it together in kind of an interesting way. Right. But in that, it's the construction of that that I think is the uniqueness of the product. Not that they did something that this is a one-off, you know, this has never, never been done before in a different form type thing. Right. And I'm not saying that in any way as a slight to take anything away from the Valley people. No, I'm no, no. saying as a takeaway for us, what did they do that's interesting? It's not that they invented an encoder mm -hmm. that, that was already there. Other people could have used it. Mm -hmm. What they invented was a way to hook them up and do end-to-end -end training and get 60,000 freaking hours of audio. Like some <laughs> version of that as like the takeaway for how did this beat state-of-the-art? Yeah, yeah. And, and also be able to well, there is some unique stuff, but I mean, a lot of it is just good engineering, and they kind of go through this, um, like, let's go back up here. They go through, uh, they use this tokenizer, blah, 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 and then they, let's eat a bit of residual vector, RQV, which used to, they use eight hierarchical quantizers of 1,024 entries. So for each one of those little time windows, they have eight times 1,024, not sure. I forget what the number was um, on that. So the discrete representation ends up being, uh, oh, here it is, uh, 750 times eight, rather than your whatever that massive number that we were originally dealing with. So they do a huge data reduction here on this by quantitizing it and still get reasonable production because all they really want to do is learn the representation, train a big enough, a big old model so that it can generate the others, uh, the output for it. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, so so my understanding of this, and I actually haven't had a chance to to really fully read the paper, okay, is if people aren't familiar with vector quantization, you basically you have a dictionary, a code book, whatever you want to call it, a lookup table, mm -hmm. and you just say, here's my input, and let me find the entry that is the closest to it. And I will use that as my approximation. So exactly. In, in if you're just using like floating point numbers, you can just say, I'm gonna round it. I'm gonna round it to the nearest hundredth, and then I will have. You know, yeah. between zero and one, I will have a hundred possible values in my dictionary, right? <laughs> These are multi-dimensional numbers, so it's not as quite as simple as just rounding to the nearest hundredth, but it's the same general concept, okay? Right. But, what they're but here, doing from that diagram that I saw is once I say the closest, the closest, and they're using 1,024, the closest entry in my dictionary is entry one, two, three. Mm -hmm. They then take that dictionary value and they subtract it from your raw data and they see what's left. And that's mm -hmm. what they pass the dictionary to, to say, do the same vector quantization again. And they do this eight times. So you can imagine that if I said, hey, I'm going to take a number, I'm going to round it to the nearest tenth. And then I'm going to take whatever the residual is and I'm going to round that to the nearest whatever. The equivalent, I mean, it's not exactly the same thing, but you can see that then you're effectively getting eight digits of precision it's as if you rounded it to the nearest 10 to the minus 8 right in this case the, it's a multi-dimensional vector but it's you're getting quite a bit of precision mm -hmm. the other thing that's key is when you do vector quantization you discretize what's already continuous data because currently our our transformers require uh uh discrete sequences they don't mm -hmm. operate on continuous time data yep yeah, yeah. And the, the other thing is you can do it, then everything happens in parallel, you know, so, right, because you can, it's a pipeline, just, just pipe it down. So you can just turn, the, every time you turn the crank, if you will, you get, you move things down that pipeline. So that's, an, you know, that's just an optimization thing. Uh, okay, where are we doing time-wise? Okay, I'm going to see here. Yeah. Well, let's just finish with this. Um, so we'll just finish with this like or one maybe, and then we'll, we'll just kind of open the floors for questions and things like that, or uh, just general discussion. Um, okay. So we've, we've seen they use this tokenizer to tokenize the audio and then they break it here. As they said, they, Essentially, for a 10-second waveform, it's 24,000 because it's at 24 kilohertz. Um, so 24, you know, times 24 times the kilohertz rate, and then we get divided by 320, and they downsample it, timestamp, and then they have eight numbers of quantizers. Now, the other thing to note is in this, I believe we can see it here. Oh no, we can't see it quite here. We're going to get there. They use different types different ways to uh, quantitize it for various reasons. Um, and they'll talk about that. It's more performance rationale, I believe. Or Ted, I think that you kind of maybe hit the other thing that I hadn't thought of, which was one time when you're out to, when you're out, you know, n number of digits of accuracy, the impact of being slightly off gets less and less and less, orders of magnitude less, right, as you go out there. So you can afford to be a little, a little, um, what would the word be? You can afford to do what's more efficient versus which is probably more accurate. Because you'll see they do that too in their area. Okay, let's see here. Do we... Oh, shoot. Why is my Apple Watch talking to me? Does anybody know? Did I hit the wrong button? It's okay. My uh, wife's watch thinks that she says, hey, Siri, all the time whenever she's just randomly talking. Is that what I did? It says, let's see here. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying you did say those words, but in terms of the opposite, we're doing text to speech. In terms of speech to text, like <laughs> it's constantly thinking, oh, did you say, hey, Siri, blah, 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 blah. Let me answer that. And it's like really weird off the wall responses. Oh, okay. Maybe that's what it is. Uh, I'm trying to decide how far we should go because I don't want to get too far down into this, into the transformer stuff. Uh, by the way, those transformers. 
um, because I want to spend some time in here, and I think that there'll be a it's fairly discontinuous. Um, okay, so we could spend a little bit more time on the encoder. So I okay. just want to check because I haven't really had a chance to read the paper, but I think no, I'm no, on the enough. fly picking this up. Does mm -hmm. everybody else understand how we're taking a waveform that it looks like they're saying is 24 kilohertz because it's just voice. It's not like super high fidelity, you know, audio, yeah. right? Yeah, this is not for so, audio files or anything. Like that. So it's, it's 24,000 floating point numbers per second. And we're going to transform it into a different stream that's going to be 75 vectors, matrices, whatever, per second. Because if people don't get that, we could spend a little bit more time just, just getting everybody on the same page. Yeah. And then that'll be the input for whatever the next chunk that they talk about. Yep. Questions? Have we lost everybody? <laughs> yeah, Ted, can you just say that one more time? Just re yeah. So just looking at this paragraph. Mm -hmm. So the audio that comes in is, assuming it's mono, not stereo, it's 24,000 floating point numbers per second. And it's right just here. the power that you would send to a speaker, you know, mm -hmm. up and down, up and down, mm -hmm. up and down of, of the person talking. So if I divide 24,000 by 75, I don't know exactly uh, uh, what that is, but let's just say it's about 300 or something like that. It, okay. is, it is 320, Ted. Oh, okay. So then they're taking 320 consecutive power signals, 175th of a second. And they're going to run this through their special vector quantization process. And so then they're going to create a block of numbers um, for each 75th of a second. So we're reducing it from 24,000 floats per second to 75 vectors and the vectors are uh, what is it it's basically you need to say which of the thousand codebook entries you want mm -hmm. times eight so it's yep. like it's like 10 bits times eight so you need 80 bits to encode um what used to be 320 floating point numbers yep so that's a huge savings and and also it, it is in it is in uh digital format that we can actually use in, in something else, which we'll unfortunately have to wait till next time to get to on that. Yeah, I mean, in an extreme hypothetical world, you could have just said, well, for three seconds, I'm just gonna send a 130,000 length sequence to my transform, mm -hmm. right? But we know that transformers with their quadratic performance, they don't do well with super long sequences. So usually we have to find some way to create our embedding so that we're topping out around a thousand or 2000 length sequences. I think chat GPT went all the way to 8,000, something like that. Really? Wow. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure, but, but I mean, if you talk to chat GPT for a while, at some point it's going to say, Hey, you need to start a new conversation. Cause I've exceeded the max length of my prompt. Oh, so that's, that's just because it's concatenating this on and concatenating yeah. as you yeah. as you type, you know, well, what about this or what about that? You know, that right. aspect, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. So so it, it'll know things that you referred to earlier mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in your in your conversation because it's just concatenating everything. And then they try not to say it in such stark terms, but basically at some point you will hit the maximum length of how many tokens they can put into it. And so then they're saying you need to start a new conversation, and that's how they they warn you that it's not going to remember the things you talked about earlier because you're starting new. Got it. Got it. That that's pretty smart of them to do it that way. Doesn't seem to be bothering many people. So anyway. Oh, hey, by the way, yeah. I just put in um there's this really great U of I course in um audio engineering. Uh-huh. Um, and they, you know, totally have all of the syllabi open. The second link is all of that. They actually have this whole uh, auditorymodels.org, mm -hmm. which is like this hyper audit audio engineering super world. <laughs> and uh, it's really amazing, actually. And uh, and what's great is it's, it's you know, this is like real double E, C, E stuff. 
Uh-huh. So it's like I'm getting all this PTSD from this <laughs> from back in school. <laughs> but, you know, it's like the uh, you thought you were never going to need to remember that again. So no, just... <laughs> I, I literally remember like purposely like not taking those last three physics classes and taking econ and, and just like <laughs> yep, I'm done, I'm good. And then it's like oh man, that might agree, I'm out of here, man. <laughs> Thirty years later, I'm just like uh, uh, you know, like what's the Hertz conversion and the waveform? You know, it's like. Yeah, but uh, hey, the good thing is we're going to stop here. And when we pick up next week, we'll be in the digital world. We will not be in the analog anymore. So, so, so you can you can you can go back to, and be comfortable there and just kind of. Yes, you know, I will. Okay, man. No, but I, now I I'm like all like, you know, like like a uh, inferiority complex. So I got to like waste time to like not feel I'm a loser here. So I have to. <laughs> That's no, like the no, was... almost engineer like a uh, dilemma, you know. <laughs> I've been trying to be an almost engineer for 40 years. So yeah, <laughs> yeah let me tell you, I, you know, my degrees are in geology and physics. I can tell you how much geophysics I do. Zero. Yeah, that was a total exactly. waste, but I'll tell but you anyhow. though, my friends that did Kim E, mm-hmm. like they're legit. I mean, they mm-hmm. like I know very few Kim E's that bailed. Like they most of them stayed. And just the, like those are like the true committed people were the Kimmies. Committed, know? committed is probably the right word I would use yeah. in that context. But okay. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, so we're we're pretty much coming on time, and I think this is a good stopping point. So, uh, questions, uh, thoughts, anybody? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll come to my question, but I think the Kimmy guys were committed. <laughs> That's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so uh, how much I'm time still, in the lab, you know, sniffing things. <laughs> so, so looking at this, uh, uh, the text here that you have uh, still presenting, Jerry. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So those seventy-five tokens that it has, right? So it's it's a three twenty-four reduction, mm-hmm. uh, or or whatever it is, seventy-five uh, data points. Then it's there's an embedding for that, uh, mm-hmm. which is. 1,024 entries. So that's the code, the code size, 1,024. Is that right? Well, let's see. Yeah, because each of the, there are quantitizers that they push through and each one has 1,024 slots, spaces, whatever you want to call it for it, right? So, so that's the dictionary size or the lookup table size, 1,024 yeah. quotes. Is that what it is? Okay. So then it will choose eight of those corresponding to 75 input, but eight at each stage, right? So, oh, sorry, uh, one, one code at each stage. How, how big is the individual code? Well, it says here the discrete representation is a matrix of 750 by eight entries, right? So is that what you're asking? I'm not quite sure what your question is there. So there are eight entries, mm-hmm. 10 seconds is 75 times 10. So okay. because 10, each second is 75. So mm-hmm. it is 730 times eight mm-hmm. entries because there are, it's a hierarchy of eight or the, or the down sampling eight times or seven mm-hmm. times, right? So that's mm-hmm. what it is. So this is the number of tokens I see. Uh, or not the number of tokens, but the number of codes. Is that right? Because it's picking yeah, it's, at each. Yeah, it's a code, it's a codex. So, so it's, codes is probably it, a better word. So 750 times eight uh, codes for 10 second sample. And each code is how big? Hmm? Each it's, code is how big? Well, it's it's just an integer, I believe. So, yeah. so each each dictionary in the vector quantizer has to be three hundred and twenty long. Mm-hmm. Well, unless the encoder is shrinking it, I, I'm not quite sure because the raw waveform, that little um, blue Squiggly. purple trapezoid on the left, it's not clear here. But Roger posted, I think it was Roger posted a link to the actual and codec thing. So they have some 1D CNN. So they may actually reduce the dimensionality down a little bit. But if it were the raw data, it would be 320 floating point numbers. And so then your dictionary length would need to be 320. Your your, your dictionary entries would each need to be 320 long. Okay. Does that answer your question, Dave? me it seems like the key point here is sorry there's a yes block. It, it does sorry sorry for the delay there 
there, there's a block that converts a waveform into a sequence of tokens at 75 hertz. Yep. And, and yes. the rest the, 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 the huge takeaway is it goes from an analog signal to D. 75 fairly short vectors per second. Um, so if you're doing a three second clip like they showed in the on the demo page, right? That's mm -hmm. only like 200 something tokens. Or 25, yeah. 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 Now behind the scenes, in order to deconstruct that, you do need the the eight different dictionaries yeah. in order to reconstruct it. But the transformer doesn't need to worry about that. It just needs to know uh, the That's eight happened. dictionary entry numbers, yep. which which really aren't even that big. They're not even floating point numbers. They're just integers between one and you know a thousand twenty four. Yeah, that was my other question. What's the uh, dimensionality of that? So that is just a one number, that's basically. Okay. We'll see later. I, I haven't read the paper. Dave, it probably is going to go into an embedding and become highly dimensional mm -hmm. anyway. Okay. It, yeah, it is just a, it is a, very, you know, a variation of a transformer. So all your transformer knowledge still works. Yeah. Um, before we get going any much further, um, if you would like to get on the uh, <coughs> Slack, please send me your email. Somebody already did. Jerry, um, I actually uh, post, Jerry, I posted in the chat, actually, a link uh, that oh. people are supposed to be able to click on, and it uh, invites them automatically. Oh, okay. Well, I don't have to do that then. Hey, I'm out of a yeah. job. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> so, Jerry, just one other thing. Mm -hmm. So, we've now gone from raw audio mm -hmm. to 70 fifths of a second. Mm -hmm. We still don't have phonemes. We just have 70 fifths of a second, right? Um, yes, I believe you're correct. Right. So, we're going to get, we're gonna get there, though, Ted. Yeah. I'm, but I'm just, just qualifying, like what we've done so far, we we chunked it up, but we still don't know. You know, especially if you talk slowly, then that O is going to cover multiple, multiple seventy-five, seventy-fifths chunks in a row. Yeah. Hmm. Let me think about that. But yeah, I get you know just on, just on the face of it because it is it's an A to D conversion, right? Really, right? We're just going from the analog space where the, the words and we're converting it to numbers. Um, ba, 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 ba. Yeah. Is that, yeah, yeah, that sounds reasonable. Yeah, I seem to recall that what Wave to Vec did a thing where, um, where it would guess sort of what the phoneme is. And if it saw like a lot of O guesses in a row, it would just sort of say, like, this is all one slow, one, one long <laughs> O, you know. And then just would it just uh, then put something in there that said hold that O for you know n number of periods or whatever want to call it? Well, so like wave to vec, I think was doing audio to text, right? Uh -huh. Sort of. And so basically, so it, was, it would I think it just it did some sort of clustering thing to say like, okay, if like if somebody talks really fast, then you need to emit a lot of letters per second, right? Mm -hmm. But if they're talking really slowly, that so that's how it manages to to adjust for that. Is it's just sort of just if I remember right, it was like doing clustering or something, and so it would say like, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, uh, for this fast talker, there was you know whatever the unit of time was, you know, ten hundredths of a second, and then you're on to the next phoneme. But for this other person, they talk really slow. It was like sixty five, you know hundredths of a second, one phoneme, the next 65, one phoneme, just because they were like super slow. Talking. Okay. All right, well, we are at uh, time. In fact, we're a little bit over here. So we're gonna stop kind of on the, uh, we're right here at the end of this section here, right before the, the uh, speech quantization background. I think, Ted, this kind of went over a lot of what you just just kind of work through there here, um, but it would be good to look at this again um, next week, and we'll pick up from here. Questions, comments, anybody? Hey Jerry, great presentation. Thank you for doing this. 
Hey, yeah, thanks, Jerry. Hey, no yeah, problem. Thanks, Great Jerry. job, Jerry. Good patience with us. Yeah, um, like I said, like <laughs> no, no, no. This is this is, uh, is is my life bad that this is the highlight of my week? You know, meeting with you guys and things like that. But uh, uh, sad. <laughs> real sad. Uh, but yeah, no, no. Th this was really good. Uh, anyway, okay. I'm going to.